All right, so good evening. My name is Gerard Beagle, and I'm president of Shannon and Wilson. On behalf of Shannon and Wilson and the University of Washington Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, I'd like to welcome all of you to the 2018 Stanley D. Wilson Memorial Lecture. It's great to see so many people in attendance. This year, we celebrate our 64th anniversary since the founding of our firm by Stan Wilson and Bill Shannon here in Seattle. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to mention that uh, Shannon and Wilson, the Shannon and Wilson family recently experienced the passing of two individuals who played a major part in the founding and growth of our firm. Mrs. Ellen Shannon passed away on February 14th at the great age of 102. She had a wonderful life and was engaged in the company in the early years with her husband and our co-founder, Bill. More recently, Ada Fazam passed away on March 30th at the age of 80. Many of you have interacted with Adif as he was the face of Shannon Wilson for 55 years. He rose quickly in a firm to become our senior vice president of marketing. He took great pride in his business family. His gracious style and innate ability to connect with people made him successful in business and in life. He was a mentor to many of us at our firm. He continued working until about one month before his death. We will miss him dearly. Mr. Shannon was involved in many high profile projects during his time at Shannon and Wilson. He became the founding president of the Associated Soil and Foundation Engineers, now known as ASFE GBA. He was also a founding member of Terra Insurance, a group formed to provide professional liability insurance for the engineering community. We appreciate the contributions that Mr. Shannon made to our profession. Our other co-founder, Stan Wilson, has often been characterized as the idea man. He was technically gifted and was respected for his extensive knowledge of earth and rock filled dams and their instrumentation. He developed instruments to measure displacements and distortions in soil and rock, many of which are widely still used today. Stan served as a consultant on large projects all over the world and on one of his consulting trips he contracted malaria, and in 1985, his career was sadly cut short by an untimely death from complications of the illness. To honor Stan's legacy, our firm established the Wilson Lecture in 1989 to foster and maintain the spirit of thoughtful and practical engineering solutions. For this year's lecture, it's an honor and a privilege to have Dr. Suzanne Lacasse, Technical Director of the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. Dr. Lacasse was born in Northern Quebec, Canada. She was educated in civil engineering at Ecole Polytechnique of Montreal and MIT. Dr. Lacasse received PhDs honoris causa from the University of Dundee and from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. She was managing director of the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute more commonly known as NGI, from 1991 to 2011. During the early part of her career, she studied soil behavior modeling and foundation engineering and design. She was a key member of the NGI team, developing practical design analysis procedures for offshore platforms subjected to storm loading. Since the mid 80s, she developed and applied statistics probability and reliability methods to assist in foundation design and decision making. She is well known for her contributions on hazard and risk assessment and risk management. Dr. Lacasse gave the 37th Terzaghi lecture on offshore geotechnics in 2001. The eighth International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering Terzaghi oration in 2013 on landslides and in 2015, the 55th Ranking Lecture on Hazard, Risk, and Reliability in Geotechnical Practice. She's a member of the National Academy of Engineers in the United States, Canada, Norway, and France. She has given keynote lectures in over 30 countries and is the author 
of over 300 scientific papers. <clears throat> I understand that seize the opportunities is one of her favorite quotes. One should grasp the opportunities to learn more and broaden one's experience. She adds that this usually only happens with hard work. No surprise there. I would suggest that this is the way she lives her life. Without further delay, please welcome Dr. Suzanne Lacasse. Thank you, thank you very much for this introduction. It was lovely, really. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, it's a big honor. <laughs> so I was very thrilled when Mike asked me if I would give the Stanley Wilson lecture. I have met Stanley Wilson once. <laughs> he would not have remembered me. I was a student at MIT and I was taking the course by Arthur Casagrande on seepage and flow nets and um, he, um, he gave us a lecture and he was visiting Arthur Casagrande. But at the GI, we have, we have, where's, where did the pointer go? <laughs> okay. <laughs> at the GI, we have three historical libraries. We have the Terzaghi Library, the Peck Library, and the Casagrande Library. All these great men have given all the documents to NGI to preserve for the geotechnical community. And there we have a lot. All these three men were good friends of Stanley Wilson, and then we have some documents. We have pictures. I'm not sure if you have this one, but we have this picture in colored in black and white. It's quite old, but you see Stan Wilson here and his friend Ralph Peck. And this is Lauritz Bierum. He was NGI's first director. And all three worked together on the Alaska earthquake. And then we have this picture taken uh, of the board for the US Army Corps of Engineers in Vicksburg. And there you find Arthur Casagrande and Stan Wilson and Ralph Peck again. And uh, this is John Lowe and Jerry Leonards. But we have more. In our three historical libraries, there's correspondence, it's about at least 10 or 15 projects and consulting reports, for example, the Manicouagan Dam in Quebec, the Long Beach projects. A lot of them are with instrumentation and inclinometers. And we have laboratory data drawn by Stan Wilson himself, especially since he was Arthur Casagrande's student, uh, odometer curves and the A-line and naturally a lot of instrumentation results. And uh, it's hidden here, but there's this PE seal. And there's an example of one of the reports there, which is the uh, horizontal ground movements in the Long Beach station. And for example, this is the, a project in Boston, and this is the soil description prepared by Stan Wilson. You can see it was quite a difficult soil profile. It's some, some of the clay is described as very unusual clay. But there, as I said, there are many projects, but one that struck me is uh, La Rance, uh, Tidal Wave Energy Project in France. And you have here a handwritten note by Stanley Wilson and the figure, which you're not supposed to read, but it's about the critical design features of this uh, project in, in France. The original design was a double wall coffer dam for La Rance, and uh, it's done for Electricité de France, EDF. And Stanley Wilson, Wilson suggested instead a cellular coffer dam and this was in 1956. And the report is reviewed and approved by Carl Terzaghi. So you can find in the libraries, the libraries are being digitized, but if you write to our secretary, to our libraries, they will find all these documents for you because they found it for me just by searching Stanley Wilson. So it's quite efficient. But we have one more thing. <laughs> Ralph Peck gave the first Stanley Wilson lecture and we have the handwritten notes by Ralph Peck when he was preparing his lecture. It was learning from the ground. And he says, he says the following about handwritten, about the professional life 
work of Stan Wilson. I expect that he probably said that in his lecture. He, when Stan Wilson was called on to investigate a problem, he approached it without preconception or theories. He learned the details of what was happening by questioning, observation, and measurement. More often than not, the ground spoke for itself and led Stan to the solution of the problem. It was his dedication to obtaining measurements in the field. One of the requisite that Ralph Peck writes, one of the requisite for success in the practice of geo geotechniques is to avoid a temptation to tell the ground how it should behave. Success entails a an humbler attitude of letting the ground speak for itself and not of persuading it to modify the behavior to suit our ends. The art of letting the soil speak for itself is at the heart of the good practice in geotechniques. So that's how Ralph Peck saw his good friend Stan Wilson. So if you're ever interested, you can just contact the people at NGI and they will find the documents for you. There were many more projects, but I just summarized two of them. The topic of my lecture is reliability-based design. And there, there are three approaches today um, which are commonly used. The working stress design, often written WSD, it's based on an overall factor of safety and has been used for a long time. This is the most common way of doing some design in soil mechanics. But the newer design codes use what's called an LRFD approach, load, factor, uh, load resistance factor design. This is what's the most common in the United States. And we have the equivalent in Europe, which is called uh, partial safety factors. And where we have a safety factor on the load and a safety factor on the resistance. But what I'm going to talk mostly about is the reliability-based design using a target annual failure probability or a target reliability index. And I will dare say that it's a more rigorous or a more complete approach. It accounts for the uncertainty in the analysis parameters and their co possible correlation. And I believe that it will give you a more robust design. Some of the concepts to this reliability-based design is all of our prediction, all of our calculations are subject to uncertainty. And because of uncertainties, it is not fe feasible to practically or economically assure absolute safety or performance of engineering system. Realistically, safety or serviceability can be assured only in terms of the probability that the available strength of resistance will be adequate to withstand the, the lifetime maximum load. Robustness is the ability to accommodate what is unforeseen. And these are what is we call uncertainties. During the presentation, just to make sure that we understand each other, uh, the one thing in reliability-based designs and probabilistic analysis, people are not very uh, good at using a, a common language. But in this presentation, we see, we see a risk is a function of hazards and consequences. And it, the hazard is the probability of an event occurring, probability of a threat occurring. The vulnerability is how much, uh, how much damage can an element at risk be subjected to. And the utility, it's the consequence, it's the cost of a loss. It, it, it could be number of lives, or it could be uh, the, da the cost for replacing, for example, uh, infrastructure that has been destroyed. ISO, the International Standard Organization, defines risk as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And this is a very unusual definition for us engineers, but it's very true. It tells you how much the uncertainty, for example, your safety factor, will affect the ac actual safety that you have against failure. And so if you look at this figure, it's a well-known figure, it compares 
the probability of failure for two situations that have exactly the same deterministic safety factor. <coughs> The blue curves, the curve has a medium safety factor of 1.5, the mean, and it has it, the uncertainty of safety factor is reflected by the width of this distribution. The probability of failure is the blue zone. The red curve has also an average safety factor of 1.5, but has a much wider uncertainty and the probability of failure is the red area under the curve where the safety factor can be less than one. But through regulation and perhaps tradition, the same factor of safety is used whether you have small uncertainties or large uncertainties. And this, this is not logical because the probability of failure in one case is much higher than the other one. So factor safeties are not sufficient to reflect the actual safety factor, uh, the actual safety margin. It's also, uh, if you're designing, it, it, the, most of this work started with offshore application. When you design three platforms beside each other, they might have the same factor of safety, but they might have very different margin of safety. It is also important to be aware that the probability of failure is never zero. Mike, do you, think, do you think we could do something with that light? I cannot read <laughs> with this light there. Yeah, maybe. Thank you. I will go now to the outline of the presentation. I've given you a few concepts about reliability-based design. So, Stanley Wilson was a man of practical geotechnical engineering. So I'm not going to go very far in any theory. I'm going to give you some case studies that illustrate the use of the method. I will present you a case of a rock fill embankment dance. We've done, just recently, we've done reliability analysis of five rock fill dams. And they each provide us new lessons. It's different every time. Then we will look at factor safety and run out distance for softer clays. Oh, thank you very much. Then there the are two other cases, quite simple, quantitative analysis, but cost effective into setting priorities for where you should uh, reduce risk along railways. And then the other one is just a fun case. We were asked to say, what is the risk of damaging a collection of Viking ships? A little discussion on target risk level, and then some conclusions. But first, we start with the Rockville Embankment Dam. This is the first dam. Now, in, no, in Norwegian, we have this awful name. <laughs> it's a mouthful even from me, but the name of it is Dravladalens <laughs> Vattendammen. <And laughs> it's uh, <laughs> difficult to pronounce. And we have many dams like this with just a lot of letters and A's, a lot of A's, a lot of D's, <laughs> and lots of V's, but OK. And it's a 30 meter high dam. You, the picture you have it here is under some of the rehabilitation we will be talking about. The dam is an old dam. Most of the dams in Norway are old today. Uh, built in the 70s, early 70s. The dam height, the dam height is 29 meters. The length is 800 meters. It has a reservoir of 58 million cubic meter. Moraine core, or till core, you would call it here, I think, in the middle. And then the filter, transition zones, and then the rock fill, which is made of quar quarried rock, which is a good quality. The analysis was done with the tree method, which I'm going to explain only shortly here. And th that's an analysis that says what happens if. So we look at different modes of failure. And then we try to follow the process until it might lead, lead to a failure. And we assess the probability of it. And this is a, a textbook case by Hartford and Becker. And was an, a dam under an earthquake with a certain probability of a happening. And then whether the gates are closed and inoperable or whether the, case, the gates are operable. And then you look at these options. And then whether you lose the reservoir control in a very simplified manner, which would lead to failure, which is the red case. And the probability of failure is the product of those probabilities along the branches of a tree. 
And naturally, when you do these analyses, there are a number of branches that do not lead to failure. Now, how do, we, uh, do you assess these probabilities on the branch of a tree? You do it with statistical estimates based on observation. For example, a thousand year earthquake has a probability of one ten to the minus three per year of occurring. Uh, results of stability analysis, um, of finite element analysis. You can use uh, engineering calculations, and then you can also use expert judgment. And in this type of analysis, there is quite a bit of experience and judgment that comes in in the estimate. And this is usually done by an expert team. And then it's a lot of the work that probably Stanley Wilson was doing. And Steve Vick, who is probably one of the major person in this area, he quoted, the collective judgment of experts structured within a process of debate can yield as good an assessment of probabilities as mathematical analysis. Now, how do you assess the probabilities? There, there are standard tables for defining what is likely and unlikely to happen in every country, and they're slightly different. However, the International Panel for Climate Change in uh, 2012 came with its own table, which, which happened to be very close to what we're using in Norway. And the table looks like this, expressing the probability uh, for something that is virtually impossible to very unlikely, unlikely, as likely as not, that means it's unknown. So it's 50% 50, 50, 50 chances that it might happen or not happen. And then likely, very likely, and virtually certain. What the IPCC has done is rather than defining just one value, like in the case of virtually impossible, it was like 0.1% probability that would happen, they defined, IPCC defined a range, which, which is okay. But they also defined that the distribution of this range was log normal. So it, the mean was not exactly in the middle of the range. Now, if we come back to Dravladalen, Vattendammen, you have the image there from, from the sky. And uh, right now, this picture, the dam was empty. And there's a spillway here which we will discuss. And this is how the dam looks in the summer. When we were there one winter, where is the dam? That was a problem. And there's something here, and that, that is the spillway. <laughs> but still, <laughs> you have a dam. This is a, a month of March. The, the snow is melting. Uh, there will be a lot of water very soon. And still, you, the spillway is not open. And that's a dangerous situation. So if I look at the spillway again, there's, an, uh, the, there's a tunnel, an approach tunnel for the water, and the spillway, the tunnel entrance, and then it gets out here, and the water should escape there. And this spillway is what is shown here. But what, what, during our risk analysis, this problem had never been taught before, but, but just by looking at it during the winter, it, it's a difficult site, so you have to go there in a helicopter. Um, the, the approach of the spillway could be blocked by ice or by just hard packed snow. And while all the, the snow around it could melt, this would be blocking the spillway, and then it would, the water level would raise and it could be overtopping. So when we did the analysis, we look at the different failure modes that could happen. We look at weaknesses in or around the dam, like internal erosion, obviously, slides in the upstream and downstream slopes, a rock slide in the reservoir, plane of weakness in the bedrock foundation, operator error. And then we also look at external triggers, which was flood in the summer, and extreme snow and frost in the winter, like you saw one of those winters. And this year was an extreme winter. It was very, very cold, and we've never had so much snow. Just in front of my, on my balcony, there's two meters of snow this year. And an earthquake, melting of a glacier because of climate change, and sabotage, etc. The one in the bold are the ones that we prioritize. Uh, the meteor impact was not very, <laughs> very probable to happen. So before the rehabilitation, when we did the analysis, 
we look at uh, earthquake and then uh, in turn uh, overtopping due to the plugging of the spillway, internal erosion and sabotage. And I want you to look at the probability in red for the overtopping, this had never been thought of about before, but if your spillway is blocked, you might have a critical situation, and the probability of this happening was ten, 3, 10 to the minus 3 per year, and that is not acceptable. Uh, for dams, you should be at least 10 to the minus 4 or below per year. Uh, we will look at these numbers later in the, in the lecture. Um, so to <laughs> try to prevent such situation as shown here, and it really happened. This is the person, the engineer responsible for that dam. In Norway, you have a certified engineer that's responsible for each of the dams. And this is the entrance of the tunnel, and it's completely blocked. And this man is two meter high, so there's a lot of snow. So the rehabilitation was done in, in several steps. But there are a number of things that were done also for the other aspect of the dam, like for example, the slopes and the riprap and such. But those in red, there was a new spillway that was built. And there was a structure to keep open the spillway during the heavy, wind, heavy snowy winters every year. And then an increase in the drainage capacity of the tunnel. Again, to, if, if the tunnel gets partially blocked, then there should be flow through the tunnel. So here's the, the picture of this Dam uh, Dravladalen. There are two ways of writing the name, so that's the <laughs> second way. Um, this is after the rehabilitation was completed, so you see it has much nicer, more even slopes. And this is the construction that was made in order to divert the snow. It's based on the differential winds and the observation of snow in that location. We will look at it here. This was this protective cover built over the spillway approach to reduce the risk of blockage and drainage due to the snow drift. And this structure, it has holes here, and the snow accumulates here. And this, the way it's placed, it holds the, the, the spillway open because it never gets filled with snow there. And, and once, when you know the the direction of the snow is like my winter cabin is positioned such that there's never an accumulation of snow in front of the door. There's snow, the, the whole cabin gets filled with snow, but the, the opening of the door never gets filled with snow because of the wind direction. So there's a way of building to organize this. And the other picture, it gives you during this winter here, 2012, the opening in the tunnel, which is still very good. There's just a little bit of snow scene. There's a man here. Again, Norwegian, at least two meter high. So this situation that was experienced in year 2000, today in the very snowy winter of 2015, all the snow gets accumulated on top and on the sides, but the spillway <coughs> remains open. So we, we did a uh, reliability analysis, again, with the same method, event three. And now in this case, of flooding where the ice and hard snow would be blocking the spillway had an annual probability of failure to to 10 to the minus 7. The, and then what became more critical here was uh, internal erosion, 5, 10 to the minus 6. But again, nothing very critical for this dam. It's a well-behaved dam, except for the spillway. Just one parenthesis. I'm not supposed to talk about this, but we also did an analysis of sabotage. And if, if you remember, in 2011, there was an attack by one man, and he went and killed 77 people, 69 youngsters on an island for some weird political ideology, which was unacceptable. And since those days, then we do the analysis for sabotage in most of our risk analysis. And what we discovered, it came with the number to 10 to minus 5. The number doesn't mean that much, but we, none of the dams in Norway are protected. You know, in Norway, the, the country, Everybody has a right to walk everywhere. So my winter cabin, anybody goes skis on. I own two acres, but <laughs> they can ski everywhere there. That's just the law in Norway. And you can go and walk on all the dams. There's no, there's no barriers. So from, from now on, well, this was done in 2015, now there are barriers. You cannot go and walk on dams anymore. 
not that we expect to have a terrorist. We don't think that a dam will be, a, an isolated dam will be a major terrorist uh, target. But it suddenly made us realize that we, we were much too blue-eyed. <laughs> we thought that the dams were for everybody to walk on. But okay, to come back to our Dravladalen dam, um, this is a plot that gives you the annual probability of failure based on the US statistics for uh, dams based on internal erosion. And here was the probability of failure accumulated for all modes of failure for Dravladalen, it's a short name for it, before the rehabilitation. And after the rehabilitation, we were much below what has been observed for US dams, so the owner felt much better. I have one more illustration of using reliability-based design for a dam. This is a, it's, <laughs> its name is New Hellewatten. <laughs> um, it's 82 meter high. And this is also a dam from the 70s, which has been well behaved, shown no in signs of internal erosion, no sinkholes, no uh, movement. The, we don't see any leakage anywhere. So it has had 60 years of well-behaved behavior. Um, the slopes of the rock fill are a bit steeper than what the requirement is. It, it, the requirement is to be one in 1.4, 1 1.5, and it's like one in 1.43 or something, small difference. And we have a very uh, strict authority on dams. And then for this well-behaved dam for the past 70 years, then they say, well, the requirement is you have to redo the slopes of the dam. And naturally, this doesn't sound <laughs> very interesting. It costs millions of dollars to redo a rock fill dam of this type or to, to flatten the slopes. So here we did a Monte Carlo simulation of the slope stability of these, uh, the rock fill uh, on both sides. But I'm just going to show you the downstream side now. And the factor safety was a function of the resistance and the load. And we had uncertainties in the load, but it was mainly the gravity and water pressure, not such large uncertainty. But on the resistance, it was the, the friction angle of the rock fill and the properties of the core. And then what are the effective stresses, which here effective is written in Norwegian for some reason. <laughs> so <clears throat> we did the analysis. Uh, factor safety up to 10,000 time to cover the entire range of possible variation of the load and resistance. We obtained two slip surfaces which were of interest, one that was very shallow, slip surface A, and one that was deeper, slip surface B. When you did the deterministic analysis to satisfy the authorities, then the factor safety was 158, and for the deeper slope, 132, and the requirement is 1.4. And therefore, there should be a uh, um, fixing or flattening of the slope. And this is the requirement when the dam is new. And you know, a lot, most of these embankment dams, they fail in the first year or in the first five years, but very few of them fail after 50 or 60 years unless you have an enormous sinkhole developing, but that is quite infrequent. So what we did is we did a probabilistic analysis of the stability, taking into account the uncertainties in the parameters, but mostly the uncertainty in the friction angle of the rock fill. And here's an illustration of the friction angle of the rock fill, the secant friction angle phi. It depends on the effective stress, which is in the uh, horizontal axis, and it depends on the quality of the rock fill uh, from being well, well compacted to not being well compacted. And in red is NVE's authority in Norway for dams. And that is the, crit the criteria of friction angle should be used for new dams when you've just compacted. Now this is a dam that has lived for 70 years, that has settled and things have been in place and behave very nicely. So we did a probabilistic analysis for each of the two slip surfaces, but looking, including the uncertainty in the friction angle. Now you can look, see for slip surface A, whereas the requirement 
is about 48 degrees, yes, 48 degrees. The uncertainty in the friction angle is quite large. This data is the classical data by LEPS, with excellent papers in the 70s and 80s, plus additional uh, measurements in the laboratory that were done at NGI on different rock fill densities and rock fill uh, arrangement of particles. For slope slip surface B, the friction angle is lower because the effective stress is deeper, so the effective stress is higher. But again, the mean value is above what the value is specified. And doing this Monte Carlo simulation a thousand times uh, gave us annual failure probabilities, which were very, very low, 10 to the minus 7 or so. So this was used in the argumentation of the dam owner, again, with, to the authorities to say, well, the requirement for an old dam that has behaved very well should not be the same as for the, fir the dam during the first water filling. And fortunately, they were, they were heard, so they didn't have to spend all this money. So the added value of the reliability analysis in the case of these dams is the first risk analysis that I showed you identified a new and so far ignored mode of failure. Now we do these, we look at the spillway in every single dam since then. The best estimate of the annual property of failure after the rehabilitation was 10 to the minus 5 and is now lower than the reported probabilities of failure for dams worldwide. And the rehabilitation reduced the estimated probability of failure significantly. And the uncertainty about sabotage and terrorists were quite large. And then new preca precautionary measures have been undertaken now. Event three analysis, although it's um, engineering judgment, but it's still quantitative, it looks at all the potential failure modes in a systematic manner. And it can be used as a diagnostic tool. And at the same time, it can be used for the whole entire lifetime of the, of the uh, dam. So if something happens, then you can go back to event three and then readjust your probabilities and then see what might happen and whether a critical situation will occur. These uh, probabilistic type of analysis are often called a systematic application of engineering judgment. I'm going to move to the second case study, which is a factor safety for uh, soft clay and the run out. And here are the results of two plexus analysis. The top one is for an elasto perfectly plastic material. It's equivalent to doing a limit equilibrium analysis, which is the most common method to doing stability analysis in our profession, and which will continue to be used. The bottom figures is the analysis for strain softening material. It could be clay, it could be quick clay, or it could be tailings material. We, we have found that the tailings that we're testing, uh, they behave with a peak, and then they get a strain softening behavior. So we did a number of back calculation for many, many of the landslides in Norway on, on the strain softening material. And they teach us that limit equilibrium analysis, the elastoplastic analysis, they cannot find a critical mechanism of failure and cannot model progressive failure nor ensure strain compatibility along the failure surface. And if we are going to continue to use limit equilibrium analysis, and we will, the profession will, we do not do a finite element analysis for every single say, type of stability analysis that we do then we need to account for the strain softening and progressive failure, like, for example, in tailings dams. So how can we find a factor to correct for this, or to account for this strain softening? So we suggested saying, OK, the safety factor for strain softening would be the safety factor specified in the code times a factor to account for the softening. So this we solve also with Monte Carlo simulation. And we ran a number of stability analysis for several cases of uh, sensitive material. And here you have the failure load as a function of the required reduction in peak shear strength in order to model the strain softening. And um, the mean of these analysis was 1.09, or yeah, 1.09. The, there were 2% two, two that were higher than 1.2, and then there were 12% that were above 1.15. But most of the data are gathered there. 
Now, the person who's very sharp is going to say, but how come you have some safety factors which are 1.0? Yes, and then we look back at these cases, and that's when failure occurred in the crust above the, the sensitive material. And then there was no reduction that was needed in the safety factor. The results of the Monte Carlo simulation are shown here with some kind of a dis yeah, histogram and the distribution, which looks very much like a log normal. And our job now, the requirement is a safety factor in Norway, is safety factor 1.4 today. By how much should we increase the safety factor to take into account for the softening when you're using limit equilibrium analysis? And looking at the data, we, we found three factors that were significant. It was the uh, shear strain at the peak, shear stress. And we defined a shear strain at 80% reduction of the peak shear stress, shown here. And the third factor was the thickness of the crust above the sensitive material. And so that's what call, it's called a Z reference, a depth of reference. And then the rate of increase on drain shear strength with depth was also an important factor. Now, I skip all the analysis that was done in between. It was a research project over several years. But I give you one example of the reduction factors. There's reduction factors as a function of each of the parameters I mentioned. But this one is a function of the thickness of the crust above the sensitive material. And how big should the softening factor be? And these are data from the case studies. And the bottom line is the mean value. And the top line is plus one standard deviation. And now in the code, the, the correction factor, when you use limiting equilibrium analysis, you need to increase the safety factor by this factor here as a function of how thick of material you have above the sensitive clay. I'm going to show you also another particularity of the Norwegian code. The Norwegian code says when you have a standing slope and the safety factor is not 1.4, then you should increase this factor safety. And you should increase it by a certain amount, a certain minimum improvement in factor safety in 1.15 to 1.2, for example. And <coughs> This is a function of what is the consequence of a failure. If there are lives that are at risk, then it's a consequence class one. But if it's just a commercial building, it's consequence class two. Now, we transform this figure, which is in the code, to a figure like this, which is if this is the initial safety factor, what is the required safety factor given that you have a standing slope? And what's interesting, let's say that you have a safety factor you calculate safety factor 1.0, but the slope is standing. You should increase it for the case of high consequences to about 115. Not 1.4, but 115. And if you have an initial safety factor 1.2, you should increase it to 1.3. Why is that? That is because it's um, a hidden way of using Bayesian updating. Bayesian updating is if you add some knowledge then you can reduce the requirement. In this case, you have a standing slope. That means the slope has a safety factor at least one. It's not failing. And if it's moving, that's something else. But let's see, a standing slope is one that is not moving. And you've calculated you have a safety factor 1.2. Then the code requires you to improve it to 1.3 and not necessarily to 1.4 because you've improved the stability by a factor of about 15%. So it's an unconscious uh, use of statistics in the code. Uh, there's more work being done, but that's the code today, and we're working in changing it further <laughs> with time. OK, but when, when you ha once you have a failure, one of the most important things to determine is how far and how far the slide will run, and how thick the material will be, and how fast it will run. So and this is what we call landslide runout. So we, we're researching now a viscoplastic model with what's called a Herschel-Buckley rheology. I'm going to show you a figure. And it's a program called Binklaw. It's still in development, but it's giving such interesting results that I thought I'd show it to you. It's an extension of a Bing model, which is used, we, we developed for snow avalanche. We have a big group working on snow avalanche. And you know, snow is like a fluid. So it's nearly like 
material, a debris flow that has mixed with a lot of water and such. It's a depth average model with um, description in two horizontal direction, and it has been implemented with a finite volume method in earlier, earlier in coordinates. I'm not going to go in more detail here. And we describe the behavior with curve number four. The different models that exist today for how the viscosity is, is are shown here, but we use the red one, number four, which is the uh, Herschel Buckley, or it's also called Casson. There are two people who came with the same idea at the same time. And this is based on viscosity tests done in the laboratory on our clays, which shows a behavior like this, with this increase with a slight curve, which is similar to curve number four. Here's a description of the model. It has a constant velocity profile for the plug and parabolic velocity profile for the shear layer, shown here. And this is one of my few equations, but what's important is how you describe how the strain rate when it, the material starts moving. And it has three parameters. It, it, the initial maximum shear strength, the remolded shear strength, or at large deformation. And then there's this parameter, capital gamma, which tells you how fast the remolding occurs, how, how fast you lose, you go from the peak strength to the lower strength. So what we did, we did the reanalysis of Risa slide. We did the reanalysis, in fact, of nine uh, strain softening material, including the two big ones offshore, which is Trena Dupe and the one uh, Sturega, which maybe you've heard of. And what I'm just going to show you uh, the RISA here, the calculation for RISA. And there, based on the laboratory data, we have a peak shear stress of 20 kilopascal, and the residual shear stress, that was a quick lay, so it went down to 0.5 kilopascal. And this gamma, 0 0.02, I will illustrate to you why we chose this value. But we put some uncertainty based on the laboratory data. But for gamma, we don't have any laboratory data. And, and looking at how fast it decreases, it, it's difficult to get a good number. So we said there's an uncertainty of at least 50% in this case. And here's an illustration with different values of gamma, how fast the peak shear strength at 20 kilopascal, these are pascal, so therefore it's 2 and then reduces the value of 0 0.05 that was obtained in the laboratory. So by varying gamma, you get different rates of reducing the strength. Now, if we look at the last slide, this is a bathymetry of the quickly landslide. It started originally here, and all of a sudden, all of this flew in the water. Uh, many of you might have seen the, the landslide, but it's also on YouTube today. And here is the uh, zone that was left after the landslide. This was measured at 1,200 meters. And if you look at this a bit bigger, it's quite easy. I don't know if you can see it, but you see the boundary of where the material stopped. It, it was quite easy for the bathymetry, even a year or two afterwards, to see where the material had gone and measure the thickness. Now I'm going to show you the simulation. Here is the, the landslide that was start is in brown here. Uh, this shows the thickness of the deposit, and this shows the shear strength reduction. So in blue, that's the initial peak shear strength, and then when it's red, it is completely remolded. And this should, oh, I have to change. It doesn't work with this point, so I have to change the mouse there. No. How do I change it? There. No, didn't work. There. And you see as the slides start developing, the shear strength is red very quickly, so it's completely remolded. And the thickness of the deposit in the center is about five to six meters. And in here, it's kind of gray and brown, so it's less than a meter. Now, if you compare the observed and calculated runout distance, this was 1,200 meters, and the shape is very similar. It's not perfect yet. We're still working on it. 
But one thing we did in addition is we, we couple Monte Carlo simulation with these type of analysis here so because, well, none of the existing program give a very good estimate of runout. And what's important is we have to protect the people living in this area, there's quickly everywhere in Norway, and the same with, same with snow avalanche. So we wanted to say, well, the runout distance plus one standard deviation, then we have to keep the housing away from there. So we did Monte Carlo simulation, then you get a distribution like this, of, for example, the velocity, also for the runout distance, and for the thickness of the deposit. So you obtain a mean standard deviation. This is, for example, all the simulation and the velocity as a function of the remolding parameter and the peak shear stress. Tau gamma zero is the peak shear stress. And these are the values that were measured. There's a movie, so it's easy to find what the velocities that were measured. And that was the mean value that we use in our analysis, plus or minus one standard deviation. <coughs> but we did a study of this capital gamma and this is the part of our research right now. We're trying to do this for all of the landslide. We've done it for only two so far, the nine landslide. The shape is always very good, but uh, the distance is not always perfect. Um, and there seemed to be a value of this gamma where the runout distance, for example, becomes constant. And what the measured value was 1,200 meters. And so from a value of 0 0.02 in the remolding factor, capital gamma, it's more or less constant around this value. So today, until we finish our research on this aspect, we rec recommend the runout distance to be the mean plus one standard deviation. So in the case of the RISA landslide, which has happened, but if we need to predict it, it would be 1,200 meters plus 100 meters. So we would have like a 10% safety margin compared to what we predicted. And for example, we in red was the, the image of the deposit material after the landslide after 30 minutes. And in blue, it was the measured thickness. And that agreed also very well. So we find that the model is promising. So we're still working on this. But I thought I'd show you one more illustration of a model, not probabilistic this one. But this is the landslide in Katmarka, which happened at 12 middle of the day, and where seven houses were taken, but the landslide just went horizontally, and none of the house were, they just went horizontally, so nobody died. Everybody had to be rescued by helicopter, though. And how the landslide occurred, but after the fact, they were building a road, and they were using explosive. And it's not the explosions, the vibrations with the explosion that started the landslide, it is when they did the explosion, they did not calculate well where the soil would, the, the rock would go. The rock, when this and a big piece of rock came and fell right on top of the quick clay, penetrated the quick clay, and then made fluidized. It, it just became completely remolded. So the last slide occurred in about 10 minutes. First, this part slid, number one. Oh no, I have to change. You see, no, I have to change this one. Well, I guess I better keep the arrow. Um, part one, well, you don't see that. Okay, let's see. Part one slid first, and then right away, part two, when you take away this material, it has no support. Part two slid, then part three, then part four, and then part five. And this resulted in all this material and the houses being in the lake. So I just have to change the pointer again. <laughs> Arrow option, yes, there. Mm. And here, this is the original soil. And this is the first blasting that sent the rock in this part. So that is part one of the slide. Here's part one. And then you see part two going upwards. Part three moving in the, in the lake. And then part four. And the only part that does not get successfully model is the last part, part five. So we still have work to do. But here you see again, the shear strength is reduced to a, the lowest value. And the thickness of the material is about four to five meters. Now we're working in making this probabilistically in order to compare to the values. But the shape, again, is very promising. 
Now, two very short examples, railways. <laughs> we have lots of railways in Norway. It's a big, long country. And we have lots of landslides and lots of mountains and lots of rivers that erode the material. So how are we going to prioritize what should be done first? Well, it's a simple system based on GIS where we have a matrix. It's a qualitative method. We have a matrix of risk where we evaluate the hazards and the consequence around all of the railway corridors. The hazard includes the average slope angle, the slope directions, the soil type, the area of exposed slope, the earlier sliding evidence, uh, drainage capacity, and potential erosion with the rivers in the area. All these data are found in maps and can be superposed in a G GIS model. The consequence analysis, then it, it finds out which element can be in the path of the landslide or close to the railway, the conditions at the time of the derailment, the, the impact speed, the impact speed of the train, there's a little model, the, and then how much time you need to apply the brakes, and then the accessibility for rescue, how fast you can come and save people. And this is one of the maps. This is a one kilometer stretch. The hazard classes is illustrated with this zone here. When it's green, it's very low hazard. That means there's no slopes in the area. When it's yellow, it's medium. And when it's red, it's high. So either there's a steep slope. Oh, I, I have to change the pointer again, sorry. Uh, when it's red, there's a steep slope in the area, or there's a river. There's also a river that can erode the material and therefore cause uh, landslide failure. The consequence is the outer line here, and again, it depends on how many people live in the area, whether there's are telephone poles or electricity poles that could be damaged. And then the risk is the product of both. And then, again, where you had a high possibility of occurrence of a landslide, and me here is medium consequences, then this became an area with high risk. And this area with high risk are the ones that are prioritized for mitigation. Now, in the whole of Norway, these are the map of the railway, the important railways, and then we've covered so far all the red ones. Um, and this is where there are most mountains in Norway. And then you have a distribution. It, it is, so far, we've done 835 kilometers. So at the railway company will have to go and mitigate, or reduce the danger of a landslide in between kilometer 403 and 437 before it goes and attend to these parts here. This is a scale of high risk as a divided by the kilometer, and then this is just the location along the railway line. The method is simple. It's cost efficient. We have all the maps, so it's quite quickly to, you know, you look at the slope, and then you, you, we have established certain criteria, which are well known for the quick clays in Norway. And so it's good for when you have long linear infrastructure that needs to be uh, fixed. So, and it's been in use now for a couple of years. Now, just a few slides about the Viking ships. We have a Viking ship museum, it's shown here. And it's going to be extended with this nice half moon. Some kind of architect had a lot of fun doing this. And in here, we have our Viking ships. I just have one picture of the Viking ship. And they are, they are very old, and they're very fragile. And <laughs> even if you walk beside it, sometimes you see some little dust falling down. And the authorities do not want, for this extension here, we have to have quite a bit of heavy work. They do not want to close the museum. They don't want to isolate the boats. They don't want to move the boats. So the, the, Museum conser Conservatory was not very cooperative. And so we're the geotechnical consultant, and we are sure that if one ship gets damaged, we are going to be sued. <laughs> so, so then we did an illustration. I'm sorry this one is in Norwegian, but here you have the Viking ship today, and the extension is going to be here. And this is a map of all, it's a bit small, I didn't realize that, of all the construction activities. And, 
the, 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 the orange here is all the traffic, heavy truck, trucks that we're going around transporting rock or doing excavation or transporting piles. There will be piling here. There's going to be sheet, sheet piling is, um, let's see, sheet piling is in red, shown here, and many activities. I'm just going to show you. We did a study of how much vibration would be applied in the different parts of the existing museum where the Viking ship ha are. And when the vibration were higher than what is admissible, that would cause some damage, it became red section. So this is just the traffic. So, so the trucks are going around here transporting things. And then if they do that with the speed that they are planning, these, the, the ships in these two wings will be damaged, according to us. The sheet piling operation was even worse. There was damage in all of these sections. And then I'm just showing you three of the nine operations. We, we, there was going to be a digging of trenches in order to make a, uh, an area which would uh, attenuate the vibrations from the road or so. And that did not make the situation better, it made the situation worse. <laughs> just digging for this trench was damaging all the ships in there. The only portion that does not get damaged is this part, and this so happens that there are no Viking ships there. <laughs> so, but we built a qualitative risk matrix. And in these risk matrix, you have the consequence class. Ooh, how come the, <laughs> the consequence class here and the probability of damage class here, one to five of one to five, and like no damage is uh, here and no consequences here. Now in such risk matrix, when it's red, it means it's unacceptable. When it's green, it's fine. And when it's yellow, it's in between, so you have to try to reduce the risk. And the, the, the criteria for the museum people were so, so strict <laughs> that <laughs> we, we ended up having a matrix that's completely red. And that has been very good. This analysis was not done just by NGI itself. We had a contractor, several contractors. We had the consulting engineer. We had the vibration specialist. We had the museum guy who was very <laughs> not, n would negotiate nothing. <laughs> and so, but when they saw this matrix, they said, oh, it's going to be damaged for sure. And he said, yes. <laughs> So we're hoping that they're going to accept to close the museum and to install some isolators in, in between the floor and the ships so that they can be preserved. But at least we have warned them. And if damage occurs, I, I hope we will not be sued. <laughs> now, a few words about target risk levels. Because all of this work, if we don't know what is acceptable in terms of risk, then we don't know whether the situation is acceptable or not. So how much risk is acceptable? It really depends on the situation. And this is in Bhutan. There's one road to go from India to the capital of Bhutan, and it's this one. And that you see they're carrying supplies. And then the fall before it rained a lot, so the road is, was pushed down here. And they need the road. <laughs> they don't get food without the road. So people accept to be at great risk. If there's a heavy rainfall that night, the road will disappear, and then the cars on that road will fall down. So a very common way to look at acceptable risk is using what we call FN plots, which is uh, a plot of the annual probability of an undesirable event. I wrote failure here, as a function of number of fatalities. You could also put costs instead of fatalities. And it's a, it's a very useful vehicle because we can compare probabilities of different um, situations or different structures. Everything that's above the black line in pink is non-acceptable. Everything that's below is acceptable. I haven't put numbers yet. Um, so if you end up in the non-acceptable area, you will try to reduce the consequences or to reduce the probability of the undesirable event occurring. And the first of these plots was made by a, a Stanley Whitson lecturer by Bob Whitman in 1984, and he gave his lecture here a bit later. And I was at MIT then, and this, that's just a feeling. There's no, nothing based on numbers here. 
It's consequence of failure and probability of failure. It's the number of lives lost and the cost of damage. And in those days, in 1984, one life loss was $1 million US. That number has changed. Most of the countries have such a number, but most of the countries don't tell what that number is. But I know what the number is in the United States, and I know what the number is in Norway. And they're essentially equivalent if you convert the money. But these numbers is how Professor Whitman and Greg Becker and other people at the lunch table done on a napkin felt that how often, for example, uh, the mobile drill rigs fail compared to a dam and compared to aviation in terms of times per year. And these numbers are not that bad. You have, like for example, you, the lines that he, he did for acceptable was for 10 to the minus one for, uh, no, let's see, one live loss, 10 to the minus two or so per year. Now before I show you what the codes say, these are real numbers, the FN diagram for geohazard in the US uh, over the past 100 years or so. And this is a study done, hmm, I don't know, why does this do that? Um, by a University of Maryland. And these are the curves for earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, and blizzards. If you notice, landslide is not there. Unfortunately, landslide is not recorded as a separate uh, catastrophe, and it's part of either the floods or the earthquake. And for example, for 10 fatalities, you are probably 10 to the minus one or so. This is reality, this is what happens. And then you have the Abbe Noshi has, Abbe Dinoshi has also done the same plot for man-made accidents, where it's influenced by us. And there's aviation accidents, ground fatalities, dam failures, train accidents, maritime accidents, and such. And here again, the frequency of 10 deaths is about 10 to the minus 1 to 1, so it's quite high. What did the codes say? Well, the codes have evolved a lot in the past 10 years, and then they have acceptable risk requirement. Here you have also the annual probability of a failure or of an event occurring and the number of fatalities. And okay, you have United Kingdom, Hong Kong, New South Wales, this is for dams. Hong Kong is for slopes. Uh, Denmark, European Union, and Belgium has a funny curve. Oh yeah, and this is ANCO, this is also for dams in Australia. And for 10 fatalities, although there is a range, most of the requirements are 10 to the minus four per year, which is comparable to what is the probability of the death of a child five to nine years old of all causes. So it's equivalent to what is a natural risk one has to live with. <clears throat> now, there is a zone in these plots, which is called detailed study, and it's when there's more than a thousand fatalities or more. And that is a zone where represented by extreme events. And this often neglected the residual risk due to this very low probability events and the uncertainties that accompany them is existing, but very often neglected. So it's, it's an, a risk that we knowingly accept. But these events can occur, and when they occur, they are referred as extreme event. And our conventional methods, the ones I've showed you, are not suitable to analyze, analyze such risk. So the approach that has developed, which we're using now, is called uh, stress testing, and it's the black swan event. It's for when something happens which is completely unexpected. It's a low probability, high impact event. Some people classified the tsunami in 2004 that occurred in the Indian Ocean as one of those events. Now, when we did the study of that, we found that there had been tsunamis, had been at least six tsunamis nearly as big over the past 100 years, but people had forgotten about them. So that was not such a rare event, but okay. And I don't have the time to tell you more about this, but it's a method that we're using now for dam design, and we're using it in Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kong is a very small community, lost five, six million people or so, but it's a very small area, and every time it rains, there are landslides occurring. And in 2008, they had an extreme event, and there were 2,500 landslides that occurred, 
on the island beside Hong Kong. And naturally, you won't ask the question, well, what if that had happened in Hong Kong, where everybody's living? So there was a stress testing done, which is uh, where you do, you apply the extreme event, and then you see how many landslides will occur, how many floods will occur. And this is an illustration of the map of, this is the material that gets accumulated from uh, debris flows, and like from one to two meter high, so that, that means people drown. You see the entire area of Hong Kong, the, the houses in our head between here is <laughs> covered in mud. Uh, the maximum debris flow depth is uh, the orange part, which is up to eight meters. And then the landslides that have occurred are the purple, and <laughs> they're shown nearly everywhere in the territories, and not in the flat part, but then this is completely flooded. And what that has revealed, that Hong Kong is the best country in the world in, being in terms of landslide preparedness, and they have plans for everything. But if some, an event of this magnitude that occurred in 2008 would fall in Hong Kong, they're absolutely not able to cope with you know, the, f the, flood, the subway being flooded, all the roads being blocked, impossible to go to the hospital, impossible to evacuate people. So they, they have to rethink their emergency system. So stress testing, which is an emerging method, it identifies critical rainstorms, as was done for, for Hong Kong, it evaluates the slope system response, how well it will cope with such an event, and then it can include many different hazards at the same time. And the method is not new. It was first used for aviation and for banking. Now, you, after what happened in 2008, you can wonder whether the method is reasonable, but I don't think, I don't think that financial people did the job right at that time. But stress testing is done in practice. After the accident in Japan, where an earthquake happened, was followed by a tsunami wave that oh, went over the protection walls and ended up in a nuclear accident. The uh, West European, when was the West European Nuclear Regulatory Agency, they imposed all the nuclear power plants in Europe to do a stress testing method. In other words, apply the worst earthquake and the worst rainfall that that could happen and then they f so that they find out what will happen to their plants. And so the method is being used for extreme event. So I've come to my final remarks. Natural and man-made hazards will continue to happen despite our efforts to try to prevent them. So society must learn to live with landslides and other risks. And quantitative risk assessment has evolved. So, and I believe it's a useful tool to evaluate risk, but mainly to compare alternative, to find out where we are compared for one dam compared to another dam. For, and, but it needs to be dynamic because the risk changes with time. Events occur or the weather gets worse, so you have to adjust your model every time. Vulnerability, especially of people, is much more a topic for our work than before, and it belong, it's not something we learn in school, at least not I, I did not <laughs> when I was at the university. But our new engineers have to be able to discuss this and to set numbers on it. So risk and probability tools have reached a degree of maturity today that make them effective to use in practice. They provide more insight in, than deterministic alone, and they help reduce the uncertainty and focus on safety and cost effectiveness. So our profession, us, not just the engineer, but the geologist, the geoscientist, we, we have to participate in this risk assessment and management and governance, and it requires a strong component of communication, which at least we didn't used to learn at universities. I hope it's become part of the curriculum now. Our role is not just to act as scientists and engineers that provide judgment on the safety factor. So our role is we have to provide input on the hazard, the vulnerability, the risk associated landslide, and in most cases I have been involved on what is an acceptable safety level, what is an acceptable risk. So we should be perceived more and more as reducing risk and protecting people rather than being just a number cruncher. So on this beautiful slide that happened in Norway, which uh, nobody could pay for, <laughs> The responsible did not have any money, so my tax, taxes are paying 
for this bridge that had to be replaced, deterministic analysis and design with a factor of safety, give an impression of safety. You do a design, oh, factor safety 1.5, this will never fail, oh, I'm good. But if you have not taken, taken into account the uncertainties, you don't know that the safety factor is 1.5 and that you're far from failure. For probabilistic analysis and reality-based design, they complete the picture by making explicit the uncertainties and their effects. And for robust and improved geo design, we need to have both. On this, I thank you very much for inviting me to give this lecture. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Anybody out there? How about I'll start? I have a question for you. So what do you see the biggest resistance from the engineering community to risk-based design nowadays? You know, <laughs> okay, I, I work in Norway, and I work mainly abroad, but from Norway. I don't experience any resistance from our clients anymore. It, it started with offshore and mining. Mm -hmm. And there was resistance 20 years ago offshore. Now it's common. And the dams, they were very resistant. The, the, the first response of the dam people in 1996, they said, oh, no, 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 we can't talk about risk. If we say nothing, then there's no risk. <laughs> but, but they have evolved. Now they ask us, they come to us, say, oh, can you do a risk analysis so that we see what is the effect of this uh, rehabilitation measure? And very often, the risk for tells you, well, it has absolutely no effect on the safety. Right. <laughs> it's just pretty. <laughs> so, uh, so in my world at NGI, there's hardly ever resistance anymore. E even if the people on foundations have been converted. But, but that's Norway. Right. <laughs> it's, probably, it's certainly different here in the United States. Right. Although for dams, it's quite used a lot by the Corps of Engineers. Correct, so, yeah. and more so nowadays, mm -hmm. right? Any other questions for Suzanne? Bob? Uh, just repeat the question because of the, it's being filmed and they don't hear you. <laughs> uh, uh, Bob Holtz asked how did the criteria for probably damage was set for the Viking ship. Well, we, we have done a number of experiments uh, with different types of vibration. First, it was to find out how people were affected. You know, 1,500 people responded how they felt about the vibration. And then we expanded, extended that also to different materials, different types of materials. So there was set, we don't do that alone. We, we have some vibration people, but there's also other people that are specialized much more than we are in structural vibration. And then they help us to set some criteria where different types of materials get damaged. So it's a level of vibration if it's a 0.1 millimeter per second square or whether it's uh, one millimeter per second square. So those levels were set for each of the Viking ships. The ones, now we're doing it with, with rubber underneath to make sure that it will be able to sustain the vibrations then. Um, so that was the way it was done by special, structural specialists more than us. Yeah. And the, the level of damage, that there's a standard in Norway. There are five classes, and they describe exactly. So the level one is no damage. Level two is damage can be repaired. And level three is cannot be repaired. And level five is catastrophic. So uh, that, that's a standard in Norway. We have time for one more question. Anybody out there? OK, very well. We'll go ahead some fellowship next door. We can have some more questions there. My name is Greg Fisher. I'm the chairman of the board of Shannon and Wilson. I just have a short closing statement tonight. Uh, first of all, what I want to say is that every year we try to invite a speaker who's going to have three criteria for us. The first is somebody that has some linkage to Stan Wilson. And believe me, it gets harder and harder as the years go by. And I was glad to hear Suzanne make that linkage, not only through meeting him personally, but then also bringing the NGI uh, information back to us. That I need to talk to you about some of those photographs. <laughs> Thank you very much. Second, we look for a speaker who is world renowned. And I think there'd be no argument here that the pedigree she has and the experience and expertise that she brings is fabulous. And it was a great uh, privilege to hear you speak today. And thirdly, we look for somebody who will present on a topic of interest to the community. 
And again, I think risk-based design is certainly something on the minds of us as geotechnical engineers today. But we got a bonus this time. We got two more things that we haven't had before. One, we had a speaker travel the farthest that ever came here for the, Shan for the Wilson lecture. And then secondly, we have our first female lecturer for the Stanley D. Wilson lecture. So it's a great privilege. Thank you very much again. <laughs> So in appreciation, we have a plaque for you and an honorarium, so I hope that will uh, be a good remembrance from you for coming give the lecture for us. Uh, I also want to thank briefly our, the people inside Shannon and Wilson who put this together. There's too many to name by name other than I'll say Mike Harney who leads it for us and a team that he has put together to help organize, plan, and prepare for this event. And then our partners at the University of Washington as well. It's been a good partnership over the years and we appreciate their support and help. I want to also um, remind everybody we're going to go across the hallway and there's some signs there for some refreshments and fellowship that we can have together and enjoy each other's company and, and reacquaint with each other. I want to thank you for all coming today. I want to thank you for being attentive in this presentation. But most of all, I want to thank you for helping us honor and celebrate the legacy of Stanley D. Wilson. Have a great evening. Thank you.